Hi there. My name is Kaisa Raatikainen and I am your teacher on this course on space and land use planning. Today we have a video lecture that is divided into two parts. Our main topic is the basic concepts that we will utilize throughout this course. In this first part we will start with a more theoretical approach and after watching this video you will be familiar with types of spatial data and spatial processes as well as important concepts such as habitat loss and fragmentation. So let's get started. Let's start with positioning ourselves among scientific disciplines. The two main fields of research that we apply in this course in the context of spatial land use planning are landscape ecology and conservation biology. Landscape ecology is the study of spatial variation in landscapes at a variety of scales Landscape ecology includes the biophysical and societal causes and consequences of landscape heterogeneity and above all, landscape ecology is a broadly interdisciplinary field of research. Conservation biology then is a mission-oriented discipline that focuses on how to protect and restore biodiversity or the diversity of life on Earth and like medical research, conservation biology addresses issues where quick action is critical and the consequences of failure are great. Landscape ecology and conservation biology both utilize spatial data in various ways and spatial information is the cornerstone of land use planning. Typically we see spatial data in the form of map. Here we have a map that is drawn using vector data. Vector data consists of points, lines and polygons. And when you use vector data, you can zoom in and zoom out on the map and you always see a pretty good resolution of the elements that are drawn on the map. An alternative way of drawing a map is to use raster data. And this is a map of the same location, but it looks very different. Raster data consists of pixels or grid cells. And raster data is typical for certain spatial data types, such as aerial images. With raster data, zooming in and zooming out is a bit more difficult because raster data typically has this uh, like an optimal scale. Of, of dealing with. So it doesn't look um, that informative if you zoom in out of that optimal range of, of the data accuracy. So basically spatial data consists of two things, a location and an attribute related to that location. So here, for example, we have a bond named Multarimeri. The same information is drawn on both maps. Spatial data is always an interpretation of reality and the way the information is presented affects the usage of the data. Spatial data also has its particularities that are not um, dependent on whether you are using ve vector data or raster data. One such character is autocorrelation. An autocorrelation means that locations near each other resemble themselves by their attributes. Together they form landscape elements such as lakes, peatlands and ridges. And during this course we will mainly work with raster data. That is good to remember. 
Okay, spatial data often comes across in the form of maps. But creation of a map, however, is not a straightforward process. Spatial data is derived from so-called raw data that is collected from the field or through remote sensing techniques. And when that raw data that is collected from the physical reality is processed into spatial data, it can be used to create maps. Maps are always interpretations of data, which in turn reflect the physical reality in a simplified manner. Usage of maps includes an additional interpretational step when the map is read by its users. And typically the user translates the information gained from a map in order to act on or act in the sphere of the physical world, where the data was originally derived from. In other words, the creation and usage of spatial data and maps can be seen as a discussion among realities. It forms a stepwise process of consecutive interpretations that should be kept in mind when working with spatial data and maps. An important question here is, to what extent the map or the data corresponds to physical reality. So maps are powerful tools in transferring spatial information into decision making. The process of spatial land use planning is way more complex than just drawing pretty looking maps. Here in this graph, the components of physical reality are divided into an ecological system or ecosystem at the bottom and a socio-political system on top. And land use planning is located within the interactions between these two systems. So here in the graph you can see um, the grey area, which includes actions such as capacity building, decision making, implementation. So land use planning deals with these types of actions within societies. Spatial prioritization is one form of spatial land use planning. So is environmental planning involving spatial choices. These are like the general concepts that we are working on during this course. Look at this landscape of grid cells for a while. Do you see variation? Do you see patterns? Then focus on the blue cells. If you looked at the landscape through the lens of conservation biology, you might name the differently colored cells as different habitats with edges between them and close by habitats as connected. These structural patterns of the landscape provide a stage for ecological processes that typically deal with population dynamics, especially if you were interested in species protection. Dispersal, extinction, sink source dynamics. Alternatively, you could look at the landscape using the landscape ecological perspective. Now the same patterns may have different names. The habitats form patches, the connections among the patches are referred to as corridors, and the area surrounding a focal habitat of interest is often called the matrix. A landscape ecologist would be interested in those processes that have a spatial character such as perforation and fragmentation. These landscape dynamics are tied into specific locations and thus differ from the population dynamics that, although happening within the landscape, can be studied without a spatial denominator. To sum up, a landscape ecologist is interested in the landscape per se, the landscape in itself, whereas a conservation biologist focuses on the biological or ecological attributes of that same landscape. And it is the combination of these two disciplinary approaches that is highly beneficial for spatial conservation planning. <laughs>
The reason why landscape studies are so important in land use planning and conservation practice is that they offer a way to understand how people influence ecosystems and vice versa. Spatial processes within a landscape often are results of some kind of a human impact and natural processes within ecosystems are under human influence as well. Spatial processes can be categorized in various ways that typically describe how a focal attribute of the landscape changes. For example, a forest area may be dissected by a road construction or a wetland may become shrunken due to ditching. Among the spatial processes, fragmentation is the one phenomenon that is widely studied in landscape and population ecology. Yet, it tends to be vaguely defined because in practice it involves two things. Fragmentation is often thought as including both a separation of a large and continuous habitat patch into several smaller ones and a simultaneous habitat loss. This is not correct though and I will explain a better definition for fragmentation in the next slide. It is important to note also that habitat loss can occur together with other spatial processes such as perforation or shrinkage. So habitat loss is not tied to fragmentation by default. And in itself, habitat loss is one of the greatest threats to biodiversity. Another way to study a changing landscape is to zoom out or scale up from the level of individual patches or grid cells. For example, the progress of habitat loss can be categorized into states of increasing alteration that have differing effects on the functions within the studied landscape. In this case, the word fragmented refers to a defined pattern in the landscape. In landscape ecology and conservation biology, fragmentation is understood as a process within a changing landscape. Landscape change has naturally a temporal component. If we look at the landscape on different time steps, we can detect changes in its configuration. Let's start with time step zero. Here we have um, four different patches, each with mean patch size of four units and a boundary length of nine units within the landscape. On the next time step, we see that the patches have changed. The mean patch size is now 2 and boundary length is 16. Next, we see how the landscape has become increasingly fragmented. The mean patch size is even smaller and the boundary length has increased significantly. However, five cells did not change and there were no changes in patch diversity or relative abundances among the patches. So here on landscape level, we observed no habitat loss, but fragmentation was evident. And even without habitat loss, rapid fragmentation poses ecological challenges. These include things such as edge effects, um, dispersal effects, uh, decrease in habitat quality, for example. On patch and cell level, in this example, we observed significant changes. The mean sizes of the patches decreased and the amount of edge within the landscape increased drastically. These kinds of spatial temporal dynamics are tedious to measure and analyze, but they are very important in ecological sense. It's good to remember that usually in practice, fragmentation is always combined with habitat loss. Let's continue tackling fragmentation. We start with the idea that habitat fragmentation is a landscape scale process that involves breaking apart of habitat. It usually occurs together with habitat loss, but as a spatial phenomenon that includes a change in habitat configuration, fragmentation is different from habitat loss. Fragmentation should be differentiated from habitat loss also when measuring its ecological impacts, including changes in population attributes, because fragmentation and habitat loss can have contradictory impacts in certain circumstances. <laughs> 
fragmentation per se, fragmentation in itself, can have positive ecological effects as it decreases the distances between habitat patches, which facilitates the movement of organisms in the landscape. Fragmentation per se also increases the number of habitat patches. On the other hand, it decreases the mean patch size and increases the amount of edge, both of which are detrimental to some organisms, but not to all. It is rather straightforward to step over the fragmentation versus habitat loss debate by thinking that population sizes are linearly correlated with the total amount of habitat in the landscape. That is, population size would in theory decrease or increase proportionally in relation to habitat loss or gain, irrespective of the spatial configuration of habitat patches. Habitat loss in itself typically has a very strong negative effect on population size, both in theory and in practice. A purely theoretical assumption of the dependency of population size on the amount of habitat results in a linear relationship where 0% of habitat sustains zero individuals. Yet empirical studies have shown that this proportional area hypothesis is not universally supported. Species tend to go extinct before all of their habitat is destroyed. When combined with severe habitat loss, increasing fragmentation can lead to nonlinear responses in population sizes, which can lead to unexpected species extinctions in a situation where a relatively good amount of habitat still exists, but the species under concern disappears. The term extinction threshold means at the level of remaining habitat below which the population cannot sustain itself. Species with extinction thresholds may be more prone to fragmentation effects, as shown here with a green curved solid line. Alternatively, a species may show a direct response to habitat loss without a fragmentation interaction, as shown by the dashed green line. Okay, let's have a simplified example of a situation with a nonlinear loss and fragmentation effect. Imagine a territorial species with solitary character that is highly specialized into a single habitat type and with restricted abilities to cross modified parts of the landscape. As the habitat of this species vanishes, the remaining individuals become trapped in their habitat patches, which eventually become so small that they can provide room for single territories only, for single individuals only. In the lack of adjacent territories, and given that the individuals cannot move between the batches, breeding becomes hard. As fecundity decreases under the level of mortality, the population becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually dies out. There is no new recruitment to the population. What about population density then? Habitat loss does not hypothetically affect population densities by itself. In theory, it is often assumed that the density of individuals on a small patch is the same as on a larger patch. Empirically, the relationship between population density and habitat amount is shown to be more complicated. First of all, Habitat loss and fragmentation have a joint effect on population size that is not constant in relation to the amount of habitat left in the landscape. Small patches may sustain less individuals per unit of area when compared to large patches. The effects of fragmentation on population size and density tend to kick in below a certain level of habitat loss. According to empirical studies, this species-specific threshold lies between 20% to 30% of habitat remaining. Generally, habitat loss and fragmentation have a negative impact, not only on population size, but also on population density, although the fragmentation impact evens out in situations where habitat availability is moderate or good. 
For species that are prone to fragmentation effects, population size drops faster when compared to species whose dynamics are mainly driven by total amount of habitat left. To sum up, habitat loss and fragmentation have several joint impacts on landscape configuration, including decrease in patch sizes, increase in isolation of patches, and an initial increase in number of patches, with an eventual drop towards the end as the habitat becomes scarce. All these measures correlate with each other. Also, the ecological effects of habitat loss and fragmentation are intercorrelated and thus have functional linkages. These include, for example, diminishing populations with increasing inbreeding, less genetic variation, decreasing fecundity and vitality, less adaptive capacity in terms of environmental change, and finally, increased vulnerability to stochastic events either in internal to the population or external environmental origin. The so-called extinction vortex of small populations is set up by habitat loss and fragmentation. Finally, habitat loss and fragmentation are not the only spatial issues in conservation biology. The recent horizon scans of emerging issues for global conservation and biological diversity included, for example, transarctic dispersal and colonization, assisted colonization, large-scale international land acquisitions, rapid geographic expansion of macroalgal cultivation for biofuels, redistribution of global temperature increases among ecosystems, high frequency monitoring of land cover change, exploitation of Antarctica, bumblebee invasions in new regions, effects of border fences on wild animals, effects of changing waste management on animal movements and populations. All these conservation issues have a spatial aspect in them. Thank you for listening for this lecture. This was the part one. Remember that there is more to come. Hi there. I'm your teacher Kaisa Raatikainen. I teach you on this course on spatial land use planning. And in this first lecture, I will tell you the basic concepts and the basic principles of spatial conservation planning, land use planning, and, pri and spatial prioritization. I'm filming this introduction in plus something degrees and on the lake of Lake Päijänne, and it's, it's really messy out here. I don't like to walk <laughs> in the snow. Okay, really, I, I shouldn't complain. It is so beautiful now. There's something good in the COVID pandemic and, and that's like you get to go out in the middle of your workday if you really want. The spring is coming. <laughs>